Isaiah in Isaiah 40 verse 22. Where it talks about God sitting above the circle of the earth. And we are as grasshoppers compared to Him. Do you understand the plan of God? Do you know the plan of God? Do you know God's plans for your life? Ultimately, none of us do. But we don't know. Because we're human and we're limited. Where are we going to be five years from now? Where are we going to be ten years from now? We don't know. Does that make you feel inadequate? I don't know what I'm going to be doing five years from now. I don't know how strong a Christian I'm going to be five years from now. But if we depend on ourselves for our understanding about God's plan, then we're always going to die. <coughs> In our areas of Christian service, we doubt, we doubt our role sometimes in the church. Yeah. Am I doing the right thing? Whether we're elders or deacons or Bible class teachers or whatever we're praying. Before Eric uh, agreed to be a deacon, he said he struggled with doubts. Maybe still struggles with doubts. Am I going to handle the responsibility well enough? Is somebody going to criticize me? I didn't feel full well. Adam wouldn't, wouldn't laugh at me if I had to call him and say, Adam, I messed up. But you see, I had to struggle with that desire that I did not want to admit failure. And when we feel that way in God's service, it holds us back. It holds us back from making that first step because we don't want to admit that sometimes we do fail. And we feel inadequate as a Christian. We also feel, feel inadequate about our responsibility of living out the gospel in our personal lives. We feel inadequate as, uh, as fathers. We feel inadequate as mothers. We feel inadequate when we're trying to share the gospel with others. And let me remind you of another story from the Old Testament. Think about the great man, Joshua. Joshua had been given the mantle of leadership after Moses. And could you imagine trying to follow in the footsteps of Moses? Could you imagine the feelings of inadequacy that Joshua felt? How could I live up to Moses? And Joshua had to lead the Israelites into the promised land. He has been with them for 40 years. He knows what kind of rebellious people they are. He knows that they have a hard time being faithful to God longer than, say, two seconds. And now he's got to lead them into the promised land. He's got to conquer all of the promised land from north to south and east to west. He's got to lead these people. Could you imagine how he had to fail? But God tells him in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9, He said, Joshua, I want you to be courageous. I want you to be courageous and do not be frightened or dismayed for the Lord your God will be with you. Now, God also stepped in and He helped Joshua's self-confidence. God said, Joshua, I want you to carry the Ark of the Covenants through the Jordan River. I want you to have the priests stand with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders in the middle of the Jordan River at the peak of the first season. And when they did that, the waters of the Jordan River divided. Does that sound familiar? The exact same miracle God did through Moses. And the priest stood with the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders there in the middle of the Jordan River. The waters divided, and those two million people, different ones, but the two million members of the Israelite nation walked through the Jordan River on dry ground. And Joshua chapter 4 and verse 14 says that God exalted Joshua in the eyes of the Israelites so that they respected him just like they did Moses. You see, whenever God gives us a responsibility, He gives us the ability to carry it out. You and I don't take that step because we're fearful, because we just see ourselves and we're not looking at God. But Joshua led the Israelites, and in fact, the Bible goes on to say 
that Joshua was faithful to God all of his life, and the elders of the Israelites were faithful to God all of the days of Joshua's life, and the elders who outlived Joshua and the next generation were faithful to God. Now that's something that you couldn't say about Moses. So in some ways, Joshua was even a better leader than Moses was. And yet he no doubt felt inadequate at the beginning because of the responsibilities that were on his shoulders. And so again, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 24 that God is faithful and He will do this. Now sometimes we we're not being honest with ourselves. We're not being honest with ourselves when we say, well, we can't do that. But really, we can't. Sometimes we carry on like we're being humble or I can't do that and yet we know good well we can if we would stop trusting ourselves and trust God. It's a false humility. But if we've got the ability to do something small, we step out on faith and we do it, then God is going to give us the ability to do something greater. Now is that what we're afraid of? Are we afraid of stepping out in the small areas because we don't want the bigger responsibility? Are we telling God, I don't want the big responsibility, therefore I'm not going to accept the small? Jesus' promise in Luke chapter 19 was, if you're faithful in small things, I will make you ruler over sins. Yeah, that great responsibility come. When God puts faith in us, we need to have faith in God. The third area in which we feel inadequate and we doubt as Christians is that we don't uh, is that we fail. And we're afraid of failing. We're afraid of admitting that we're not perfect. Now one of the reasons why is because we measure church work, spiritual matters, by worldly standards. Now in the world, you have to push yourself to the front. The world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there and you have to be aggressive and you have to push yourself out in the front. And for those of us who are Christians, sometimes that just doesn't feel right. But we, we measure church standards by worldly standards, but that's not how God measures things. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, when uh, God sent Samuel to anoint the next king over Israel, Samuel goes to Bethlehem to the house of Jesse. And Jesse brings out his oldest son, Eliab, who looks very much like the current king, King Saul. He's tall, broad shoulders, handsome. He looks like he'd be a great military leader. But God says, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, I don't look at the outside. I look at the heart. So you see, God doesn't measure success in spiritual matters by the same standard that we use in the business world, that we use in the outside. God has a different standard in His church. God's standard is faithfulness. If you look back at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23, that is where King Saul was told to kill all the Amalekites, and he didn't kill all the Amalekites. He brought back the best uh, the best of the animals from the flocks. He brought back the king, King Achan. And Samuel comes to him and he says, why did you not obey God? And King Samuel says, I did obey God. And Samuel says, well, where, why do you have all these animals? God told you to kill them all. Why do you have them? And Samuel says, I brought them to sacrifice to God. Worship. I brought them to worship. Samuel says, that's not good. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23, classic verses on the, the nature of our relationship with God, Samuel says, to obey is better than worship. To obey is better than the fat of rams. What's Samuel saying? Samuel is saying there is a, a hierarchy of needs as far as God is concerned. Is it good to worship? Oh, yes, God requires us to worship. But obedience comes first. Do we need to evangelize? Yes, we need to evangelize. God wants us to evangelize. But obedience comes first. God wants us to be faithful. 
And so we need to remember faithfulness is God's ultimate standard. Not having a, a, a full auditorium or, or, a, or whatever else we can think of in, in the church. God wants faithfulness more than anything else. And so we sometimes feel like failure because we measure God's work by other standards. But then you also may say, well, I just don't do things like I should as a Christian. I fail as a Christian. Well, you know what that means? This means you're being honest with yourself. You fell as a Christian. Guess what? You're going to keep failing as a Christian. Because none of us are perfect. We are going to make mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. How many times have I changed the oil in my car? Lots of times. Can't count. The time before last, I left the rubber seal on the car, put the new oil filter on top of it, screwed it in, done it a hundred times before, turned on the ignition, oil spray all over the garage. Because I left that old seal on the car. Doesn't matter how many times you do something, at some point you're going to fail. And we're going to make bad decisions. Sometimes the elders are going to make bad decisions. Sometimes the deacons are going to make bad decisions. Sometimes Bible class teachers are going to make bad decisions. We're just and we fail. And that simply shows that we're humans. Ask the Apostle Peter about failing. Matthew chapter 26, Peter spoke up and said, Lord, I will die with you, but I will not deny you. Forty verses later, the very same night, I do not know the man. I do not know the man. Confound it. I do not know the man. You now he's cursing and swearing. I do not know the man. And then he went away weeping bitter. Because he came home with Peter. He was a failure. But God didn't give up. God didn't give up on me. In fact, I don't know this for sure, but I would suspect. That it was the it was that very nature of Peter that motivated him to stand up and speak up so often it kept making him put his foot in his mouth. It was that nature that caused God to choose Peter to be that great spokesman on the day of Pentecost when the church first started. You see, sometimes our best attributes are our greatest weakness. But when we funnel it in the right direction and we wait on God and we are faithful to God, God can turn our greatest weaknesses into triumph for His cause. When we fail God, uh -oh. as we will, we need to pray for forgiveness. We need to pray for wisdom. And we need to pray for strength not to give up because of our dads. And keep moving forward. I'm going to change my own transmission fluid again. I probably will make a mistake and I may have to call Adam and say, Adam, you've got to help me out. God, keep trying. I've got a little bit of confidence now. I can move on. As Christians, we can't let our doubts hold us back from doing greater service to God. Because God deserves it. We owe it to God for saving us from our sins and using every time.